Okay. Hello, everyone, and welcome to tonight's public information session. Uh, seeing as it's now 6 p.m., we'll get this open house and workshop underway. Welcome, everyone. My name is Autumn Hume. I'm a communications officer in the city's communications and public engagement division. I'll be your MC and moderator for this evening. Uh, for privacy, we've turned off cameras and microphones because the presentation and Q&A portion is being live streamed on YouTube and recorded. If you have to leave early, want to revisit part of the presentation or share the link with a friend, you can rewatch the entire session on our YouTube channel. Our handle is at the city of Kingston. We'll also add the link in the chat for you. The workshop portion of the event this evening will not be live streamed. Uh, sometimes technology troubles happen. Here's a short, there's a list of common challenges on our Get Involved Kingston website. That's uh, getinvolved.cityofkingston.com. You can also adjust your view options so that you can see both the presentation and members of the project team at the same time. If your internet connection goes down, you can call into the meeting at the number on the screen. Please write it down just in case. We will do our best to help you with any technical problems, but sometimes the easiest way to resolve issues is to log out of Zoom and rejoin the meeting. You can do that with your registration confirmation email. And again, as a reminder, you can also follow along live on YouTube. Our handle is at the city of Kingston. Tonight's event features a short presentation followed by a question and answer opportunity, and then a facilitated workshop in small groups. During the Q&A, please use the Zoom chat feature to submit your questions. We'll track them and answer them as they come in uh, during the Q&A portion towards the end. So the presentation will occur first and then we'll um, address questions that have come up. Please note that if we don't get to your questions tonight, we will follow up. Uh, questions and answers will be summarized by the project team and emailed out to attendees afterwards at the email that you registered to attend this event with. So we'll take care of that for you. If after the event you do have a question, because sometimes these things crop up after the fact, please reach out to the project team at any time. You can email nktplan at cityofkingston.ca. Again, that's nktplan at cityofkingston.ca. And again, we'll drop that in the chat too at some point so that you have that for reference. The guidelines for participation are now on the screen. These are the City of Kingston's guidelines for ensuring everyone is able to participate fairly. We'd ask that you please take a moment to review them. Thank you. Okay, so I'm going to turn this over now to our Manager of Policy Planning, Sukriti Agarwal from the City's Planning Services to take it from here. Sukriti? Thanks, Autumn, and good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, as Autumn mentioned, my name is Sukriti Agarwal, and I'm the Manager of Policy Planning with the City's Planning Services Department. Um, today, we are here to provide you with an update on the North Kingstown Secondary Plan Project. Um, as you may know, phase one of this project was initiated in 2016 and phase two in late 2017. Um, also, as you may be aware, work on phase two was put on hold in 2019 to reallocate staff resources to the Williamsville Main Street study update and then because of the pandemic. And I know this has been a really long project and um, I want to thank all members of the community for participating in past engagement events uh, through phase one and the earlier part of phase two. Uh, we are also very appreciative of all of the guidance provided to us by the community working group throughout this project so far. Um, we will be taking away any, um, all feedback that has been provided to us uh, to date, along with comments that we received today as we advance uh, this work. Um, and with that, I'm going to pass it over to Corey Horowitz, who is a senior urban planner with Dialog, who will be taking us through the presentation for tonight. Great, thanks very much, Sukriti, and welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us tonight for the phase two reinitiation. Um, we'll move on to the next slide, uh, which is the agenda for the public open house number one. Um, so we've structured tonight's meeting with uh, about one hour for the presentation, followed by a uh, question and answer period. So we'll we'll go through the presentation fairly briskly first and then leave uh, as much time as we can for questions afterwards. Uh, the second hour will be dedicated to breakout workshops 
Um, so we'll have three discussion questions for these workshops that you'll see later on in the presentation. Next slide, please. Okay, so we'll start off with uh, section one, some introductions and background for the project, North Kingstown phase two. Next slide, please. And we just wanna recognize as well um, that there may be many people familiar with uh, some of the work that's been done, um, but also that there may be some new attendees that uh, are, are joining this conversation for the first time. I'm just noticing I'm seeing a lag in the presentation slides. Is that just on my end? Um, Cody, there does appear to be a lag. Okay. So as we wait uh, for the slide deck to, to move on, um, yeah, so this presentation will start off um, with uh, sort of a, a recap, the refamiliarize, as well as um, bring some new people into the, the project content and, and up to date on where we are with the draft, uh, draft work to date. So our team, team members and the project team in attendance tonight are of course the city of Kingston. So from the city, we have Jennifer Campbell, um, Acting Commissioner of Community Services, Tim Park, Director of Planning Services, Sakriti Agarwal, Manager of Policy Planning, Matt Cusson, Manager of Transportation Policy and Programs, uh, Niall Audi, Senior Planner with Planning Services, and Nikki Van Voot as well, Planner with Planning Services. Myself uh, from Dialogue, Dialogue is the project lead and uh, we provide urban planning, urban design uh, and engagement services. So along with myself, Dorsa Jalalian is joining us and Stephen Loveday as well, both uh, urban design experts. And we also have from Arup, the transportation lead, Michael Cavallaro, and from Bray Heritage, the cultural heritage lead, Carl Bray. Next slide, please. So with that, um, that's our project team and those representing uh, the teams tonight. Uh, we'll move into some of the uh, refresher content for the project. So the North Kingstown study area, as many of you will be familiar with already, um, generally defined by Division Street in the west, John Counter Boulevard and the rail corridor to the north, uh, the Great Cataraqui River and Bell Island to the east, and the south boundary, primarily uh, the south side of Colburn Street, uh, however, it's quite a meandering boundary line um, at, at certain places, Barrick Street, Bay Street, LaSalle Causeway, defining that boundary as well. Next slide, please. So just a bit of a, an overview here of uh, what is a secondary plan um, to situate ourselves in the North Kingstown secondary plan work. Um, generally, a secondary plan uh, provides a vision helping to guide uh, the future of an area as well as implement um, a, an area-specific policy framework, um, and it may shape things like its physical uh, development, built form, um, environmental aspects of an area, as well as social or cultural uh, ambitions and, and development of an area. Uh, secondary plans generally complement a city's uh, official plan, which is the primary planning policy and visionary document for a municipality. Um, and it adapts uh, official plan policies more specifically um, to fit an area's local context. So yeah, as I said, it may prescribe uh, things like building type and form for new development, as well as define uh, priorities for both public private investment and things like infrastructure and services. Next slide, please. And so this is uh, an overview of the project's timeline leading up to where we are today. Uh, as Sakriti spoke about a little, um, those first three stages there, um, the work that was done before the project went on hold in 2019 and was reinitiated in 2022, uh, bringing us to stage five, uh, which is focused on updates and refinement um, to the secondary plan draft materials, as well as uh, 
based on the review, some new content, uh, some of which you'll see today. So focusing on uh, the land use and density plan, technical studies like transportation, uh, as well as cultural, cultural heritage, and really uh, driving towards the policies that will actually make up the final secondary plan document. Um, so tonight, you can see under public engagement, we're at open house number one. There will be a second open house later on in this process uh, prior to uh, we prior to stage six, where we'll be finalizing the materials of the secondary plan, leading up to a, a presentation at City Council of the, the final document. And you can see as well, there have been a number of engagement activities that have taken place to date, uh, including past open houses, uh, community pop-up events, talking circles with Indigenous communities, stakeholder interviews, and so on. Next slide, please. Okay, so we're going to move into section two uh, of this presentation, the work to date, uh, where I'll provide a, a brief uh, recap of, of some of the materials that have been worked on and, and drafted already, and some of the materials we'll be building on in our current updates that we'll get into later. Next, please. So firstly, uh, this is sort of the document that, that started it all in phase one, uh, which was the visioning report and preliminary market analysis. So this was done in 2017 in close consultation with the community and it produced uh, our structuring vision and planning principles and set of design directions that are really gonna provide a foundation and inform uh, development of the secondary plan, final document and policies. Next, please. And so here's the vision that was generated from that report in, in 2017. Um, so I won't uh, I won't read every word here, but we'll give you a chance to take it in a little bit. Um, really, it it's aiming to build on the legacy of of this area and providing uh, places and opportunities to live, work, and play. Whether it be um, a variety of job opportunities, diversifying the city's economy. Um, providing spaces for things like arts and industry and hubs of community services, uh, as well as wanting to uh, continue and enhance uh, in, with things like walkable neighborhoods and, and connections to amenities in the area, the waterfront, uh, things like that. And really supporting, recognizing the neighborhood has and will continue to support a variety of, of backgrounds of people and income levels, um, and, and ultimately really be a, a resilient, sustainable, community that, that builds on its assets, such as the urban wilderness and proximity to the uh, UNESCO heritage site that is the uh, Rio Canal and the Cataraqui River and building on uh, connections with indigenous uh, peoples that have uh, really have a, a strong connection to, to these lands. Next, please. So the, the planning principles are what uh, implement that vision and in more sort of practical steps that get into a little more detail, a little more direct building towards uh, the policies of the secondary plan. So we've got eight planning principles. Um, these the first four being uh, creating, a, creating a welcoming and inclusive setting, uh, enhancing options for movement within North Kingstown. So connecting to the waterfront, for example, to neighborhoods. Uh, clustering new developments with a system of hubs of activity um, and investment and diversifying the economic and employment base. Next slide, please. And the, the second set of four principles for, for the eight, eight total uh, gets into conserving the natural and cultural heritage, which is so important to this area and, and so rich. Uh, respecting Indigenous traditions of land use, uh, in particular the Bell Island Accord, supporting arts and cultural industry, and as well implementing plans that are sustainable and resilient, uh, including design approaches and technologies. Next slide, please. And so the final uh, piece to uh, this, this visioning document or the product of the visioning report is the design direction. So these, again, build on the vision and those planning principles into a series of uh, kind of design moves that are really on the ground, um, design interventions and, and goals for the secondary plan. So strengthening connections, uh, 
providing for a finer grade network of streets and blocks, uh, mixed use uh, development and having uh, really walkable areas with services and amenities, cultivating a hub for uh, entrepreneurs and, and crafts and knowledge-based employment, uh, protecting Bell Island from development, conserving its area, um, shaping character areas, which is based on um, some of the heritage work that's been done and continuing to intensify the Division Street Montreal corridors, uh, which is really in the case of Montreal Street, um, number seven seen as kind of the spine of this study area and, and the main uh, intensification route in place for um, a kind of a critical mass of, of mixed use activity. And then lastly, um, sustaining a vibrant industrial and employment area number eight. Um, so this is an area anchored by um, the old industrial area um, in this sort of northwest of the study area. So recognizing that existing value as well. Next slide, please. So that brings us to phase two, and this is the scope of work for phase two. Um, these materials are mostly in, in draft form now, the land use and density plan, cultural heritage study, transportation master plan, servicing and stormwater studies and finance and implementation plan. Next slide. So we'll go through um, these materials, uh, which were generally last uh, presented to the public in, in 2018 and had sort of developed into 2019. Um, so these were all have all been seen before, and these are the foundation of the updates and the work that we're pursuing now um, to sort of review and refine and accounting for the, the time that's passed and the changes and how we can improve these, these things that have been uh, worked on generally by a, a different team in the past in, in the case of the land use plan. Uh, so this was this breaks down the study area into these land use designations. Uh, one thing I'll note here before moving on is just uh, the urban village category in orange, which makes up uh, a large section of Montreal Street, uh, as well as uh, the waterfront area south of Bell Park, and really intended um, as a, a mixed use, a really broad range of, of different uses that are compatible um, and can be intensified along the, the Montreal Street spine um, of this area, providing for employment as well as active retail commercial uses in addition to new housing opportunities. Next, please. And the draft density plan similarly uh, presented at the same time as the draft land use plan um, had an approach to presenting density or uh, conveying density, which uh, used something called FSI floor space index, uh, as well as fairly broad height ranges for these individual blocks, as you can see defined on the map there. Um, we've sort of reviewed and, and shifted away from this approach, as you'll see in the, the work later on in this slide deck. Um, and, in, and what we think we've really improved uh, to provide more clarity um, and look at a, a more site specific or closer analysis of, of the existing conditions and uh, the forms that are that are built on the ground and what's most appropriate in terms of uh, locations for intensification or additional um, additional uses. Next slide, please. So I'm going to pass off to uh, Carl Bray from Bray Heritage, who's leading the cultural heritage strategy here, um, just to go through um, some of the previous materials under that study. Thank you, Corey. Um, uh, my video doesn't seem to be starting, but I will certainly talk. Um, one of the things about looking at North Kingstown was that there hadn't been a lot of comprehensive um, historical analysis done in that area. So. Uh, Dr. McKendry and I and my colleagues at Archaeological Services really were somewhat starting with a clean slate. That being said, uh, Professor Murray from Queens had done an oral history project during the time that we were working on this. Um, with the interviews and workshops, we were able to gather quite a bit of information. And as I said, with Dr. McKendry, an architectural historian, she provided a chronology of development that really filled in a lot of the blanks and gave us all uh, a fairly good idea of some of the important periods in the history of this area. And so that kind of got grouped under what was called a thematic history. And you can see the main periods, these are quite arbitrary, but they give you an idea of the different stages 
of evolution in this part of the world. Next, please. And one way of kind of capturing um, the different flavors of this rather large part of Kingston was to create sub areas or we're calling them here character areas. So if you were trying to describe um, what it's like in these areas, their history, uh, how it feels to be on the ground, this was one way of doing it. And so we provided this, uh, this analysis in the form of character areas. And uh, these have been presented in previous meetings and, and seem to reach a, a fair amount of uh, uh, agreement. Next, please. Um, the Heritage Properties Group at the city and city heritage staff um, did a preliminary survey of properties um, that gave an idea of at least those that might meet provincial criteria for designation under the Heritage Act. So you'll see a lot of blue. Those are properties that looked interesting uh, on the street and maybe uh, through historical documentation, but really uh, have not been um, put in any kind of legislative uh, protection. Uh, there are a few federal properties, the depot, the old train station being one, and the, the armory down at the south end being another, and obviously the World Heritage Site of the Rideau Canal. Um, there are a few formally designated properties, like the old depot school, for example. But other than that, it's mostly an area where its character is expressed in the streetscape, in people's memories of certain activities that might have happened there, or ongoing activities. Next, please. And so there are really kind of two overall categories of heritage, if you will. One is what most people would call intangible, which you can't really touch it uh, or see it, but it's there mostly through people's memories and through their ongoing activities in place. So what you see is an air photo of the um, subject area in the 1920s. You can see how the railways dominated, how industry dominated, and how little development there was in a lot of the other areas. Um, one of the things that certainly come out of the analysis and the, and the talking circles is the importance of ongoing indigenous presence there and, and their culture. And certainly the other thing about the, the idea uh, once the Europeans arrived of it becoming the swamp ward, a strong sense of community as a working class community where you walk to work, fa mostly factory work or work on the railways. And then as part and parcel of that, of course, very strong industrial development that uh, really defined the physical character. Next, please. And stemming from that, of course, is what you could have seen on the ground at various historical periods and what still remains now. And some of that is buildings and landscape. Some of it is the topography as you step down uh, towards the river. And some of it, of course, is the views along streets, but also of the river and shoreline. Next, please. So I'll turn it back over to Corey to explain the next section. Thanks, Carl. Um, I'm actually going to pass this to Michael from Arup to run through um, the transportation master plan existing work. Thanks, Corey. Uh, happy to be back in, uh, in on this project. Um, so first off, um, the transportation master plan is being to, is proposed to be developed and uh, and and. and the rules and processes of the environmental assessment process, where uh, there's two, the two phases one and two. Uh, phase one is defining a problem and opportunity. Uh, you have we have options for um, consultation, like we're doing now, uh, to document receiving feedback on what are the issues that opportunity to 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 change and to make things better. And then once that's, that uh, that feasibility of your approach and how it all works has been determined through that problem and opportunity, uh, move into phase two where we consider the alternative solutions to resolve the the problem and and or opportunity that uh, is being discovered. And so there's a series of steps that we go through where we're looking at the impacts of alternatives and uh, and uh, and, uh, and options uh, with consultation uh, through the uh, through the. Uh, uh,
Sorry, can everyone hear me? You're coming through more clear now, yes. Yes, sorry. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, apologies if anything got dropped off. I can ask anything in the Q&A on this slide. So uh, the Transportation Master Plan uh, was prepared uh, to um, ensure the secondary policies were feasible. Um, the TMP will uh, assess the Wellington Street extension alternatives to improve access to employment lands, uh, identify priority streets, uh, develop active transportation recommendations and review of classifications. This draft uh, that you can see on the right was presented at the October 3rd, uh, 2018. Okay, so I think we're going to come back to the transportation element in a little bit. Um, Michael's just having a little bit of a tech problem. I'm just going to advance the slides a bit, Corey, and perhaps we can pick up from there. Sounds good, thanks, Autumn. Um, and I would reiterate um, there will be an opportunity uh, in the question period uh, if there are specific transportation questions on, on that material, but we'll try and come back to it. So uh, we don't have uh, representatives here tonight from uh, JL Richards and Aquaphor Beach who are leading uh, the civil servicing and stormwater management scopes, but we'll give you uh, an overview of, of those key pieces of the, the secondary plan studies that are directly related to the, the work on transportation and land use in particular, and those scopes will continue to be developed um, further into the, the uh, process and the timeline. Um, so those, those firms are, are working cooperatively with the city and utilities Kingston to assess and provide strategies for civil servicing and infrastructure serving the future of North Kingstown. Um, it will be an area specific analysis looking at uh, capacity and provision of things like stormwater, uh, sanitary sewage, uh, water use, gas, hydro, telecommunications, all those utilities um, that are needed and uh, ensuring that uh, the, the growth and future land use uh, that's proposed will be supported into the future. Next, please. And the finance and implementation plan um, will be conducted uh, in the latter part of the, the work plan process by Henson Consulting. Um, they'll be, be leading, um, building off the, the preliminary market analysis, actually that's already been completed in 2017. They'll be looking at incentives and public investments, other strategies uh, to really bring about the type of economic development uh, we're envisioning in North Kingstown in the long term. Um, and they'll also be considering Kingston's Brownfield Community Improvement Plan, CIP program, um, given that it covers so much of the North Kingstown study area and is, is relevant to so many of the employment and industrial lands in particular, um, looking at strategies for um, how, how can these sites be repurposed or just revitalized and remediated in the case of uh, environmentally contaminated sites from, from past uses, for example. Next, please. So moving into the third section of tonight's presentation, uh, acknowledging the, the pause between 2019 and, and 2023, where we are today, uh, really wanting to ensure we've uh, considered and, and captured um, things that have changed in the study area, uh, as well as citywide, uh, both from a, a policy context, development context, um, other things that uh, are going to be 
recognized uh, as we update uh, and review past materials. Next, please. So I'll pass it to uh, the city to take uh, take over the next couple slides and speak a little bit more about what's changed and what's been learned in the pause. Good evening. My name is Niall Lodi, Senior Planner with uh, City of Kingston Planning Services. So as Corey mentioned, um, the, the period of 2019 through through now, this project is largely being, being on hold. Um, but that's not to say that that period of time is has has been lost. There's been uh, many valuable contributions um, because we, as a as a department, have learned many many lessons from from other work that will ultimately inform the policy direction for NKT. For example, during the Williamsville Main Street study in 2019 and 2020, we heard from the public on the importance of built form and massing and implemented greater clarity on the location of a height within uh, Williamsville. We took additional measures to ensure improvements to the public realm and increased development setbacks, refined policies on ground floor commercial requirements to facilitate functional and feasible commercial opportunities within uh, that portion of the city, and updated policies relating to parkettes to increase recreation opportunities and further enhance the pedestrian realm. And as part of Central Kingston growth uh, strategy, which was active between 2018 and 2022, we learned that it is important to recognize differences between intensification air areas and tailor policies to promote development that is compatible with the surrounding neighborhood. We learned that it was important to test intensification areas, uh, area policies through financial feasibility analysis to ensure that the built form being recommended will be viable, and the importance of connecting with property owners within the identified intensification areas and ensuring that we're consulting on the proposed changes. And finally, during this period of time, there have been dozens and dozens of additional development applications um, that we've circulated through technical review and, and brought through public consultation with the community and heard lots of comments about uh, built form, uh, acceptable height, uh, locations for height, and the importance of good design in new developments moving forward. We as a, as a department and as a municipality have continued to work through important details relating to uh, site circulation and functionality in the layout of sites to make sure that uh, the intended visions come to fruition. We've explored improvements on building location design and orientation to respond to privacy and overlook concerns. And we have worked on uh, creative solutions to balance heritage conservation and intensification within uh, our urban areas. Next slide, please. So as part of the, the earlier work in, uh, in phase two, the 2018 work, a growth estimate was prepared to help uh, guide the built form recommendations and to test the transportation and servicing components of uh, the NKT secondary plan. As the project team was reinitiating the NKT, re, sorry, as the project team was reinitiating NKT after the pause, we identified some uh, areas of disconnect between the 2018 growth estimate and some of the current market trends in that the the market was, there was development interest in areas of NKT that hadn't previously been contemplated for development. We also identified um, that the, the density plan that Corey was highlighting earlier, that the approach taken within it was, was really quite, quite broad and we didn't feel was providing the level of clarity that uh, public and the development community would really require for for this study and the the areas of that were being identified for two to 20 stories, we thought that that range really could benefit from being uh, narrowed down and, and refined. And uh, further, there's a continued recognition that many of the potential development sites within NKT do have constraints to development, uh, such as uh, contamination, and that additional density may be required to help offset the increased costs associated with redeveloping those sites. 
So all that to say, we've we've been working on an updated uh, growth estimate that tries to kind of align more, that tries to align better with current development trends that, that we're seeing, that tries to provide a greater level of clarity in terms of the location of intensification and also the height of uh, contemplated intensification while still being uh, realistic about the costs associated with the intensification. This updated growth estimate is uh, does require updates to the, the modeling work that is very important to the transportation and, uh, and servicing aspects. And we are working to undertake those modeling updates uh, currently. I will uh, pass this back to Corey now. Thanks, Niall. Um, so the next piece here to recognize in terms of uh, what's changed is uh, sort of a, a roller coaster ride that the provincial government has taken us on with new bills and legislation as of late. Um, so since 2019, there have been several new and in some cases still evolving pieces of legislation. Um, so we'll give you some of the highlights here and really specifically how uh, which ones and how um, they're relevant to the North Kingstown study area and the, and the goals of the secondary plan. So Bill 109, um, sort of the key themes are, are really around expediting development approvals and the process through municipalities. Um, the goal of increasing housing supply broadly. Um, and the one impact of that is really um, the need for, for cities to have very clear and up-to-date um, land use policies. So whether it be the official plan, the secondary plans, the zoning bylaw, all of those um, towards facilitating the approvals process was uh, the direction there from the province. Um, so that was in 2022 and that Bill 23 also came in in 2022, the More Homes Built Faster Act. Um, so another, another piece of this is as of right zoning, meaning uh, there would be no rezoning or approvals required um, in this case to permit three residential units on any given lot. So that would include um, on, for example, a single detached house lot in a neighborhood. Um, so these are the types of directions that are captured here and, and generally also uh, a little more involvement uh, or insertion of authority from the province. So ministerial power to amend official plans, for example, uh, as well as a, a narrowing of certain city responsibilities, such as the site plan control process. Next, please. And, and more to this theme, um, the Ontario Heritage Act, uh, really looked at uh, more intentional directions around the heritage listing and designation process, uh, most notably introducing a kind of clock whereby a, a defined timeline, so two years uh, for a, a city to in state their intention to designate um, a listed property. So a listed property being one that's put on a, a city's heritage register as, as being significant. So previously there was no timeline associated with that. Um, so that's an example of the direction there as well as some of the other uh, measures you see in the Ontario Heritage Act. Uh, Bill 97 also in 2023, uh, really intending to advance this goal of uh, increased housing supply of the province, uh, 1.5 million new homes by 2031. Uh, and then finally, the draft uh, 2023 provincial planning statement, which effectively combines uh, previous frameworks of the provincial policy statement and the growth plan for the Greater Golden Horseshoe. Um, notably there, for the case of the study area, um, the definition of employment areas, uh, essentially it removes uh, this designation for certain employment uses. Uh, it it's, would still apply to heavier industry, but it uh, generally would ease the process of converting or introducing uh, uses such as residential or, or commercial to um, lighter industrial or commercial um, or institutional uses that may have previously been employment areas. Next, please. So I think we're just going to double back now um, and Michael has rejoined us and we will go back through some of the transportation stuff from earlier. Bear with me for a moment. Sorry about that, everyone. My uh, oh, internet wasn't playing nice. Um, sounding better. Take it away. 
<laughs> Great, thank you very much. Uh, so uh, back in uh, 2018, when we commenced phase two, we uh, we said that we would uh, include the the principles of the phase one and two of the environmental assessment process. This will allow and this allows the city to implement phases three and four, having gone through the process of phase one and two. Uh, phase one and two includes a problem or opportunity sta statement where we define our identify our problem or our opportunity or both. Uh, and then we have a consultation to to discuss it and uh, and and get the clear direction for the community, which we we got in uh, in 2010. We'll be revisiting again uh, through this process. Uh, and then in phase two, we uh, we will go through the alternative solutions section and uh, and then figure out um, what what what's what's possible to be implemented in the plan, how it fits in within the existing uh, transportation conditions, what are the alternatives, what's all the work assigned to them. And then prepare and prepare an alternatives and evaluate them and then uh, and then take them to public consultation for review and then we select the preferred options and move uh, move those recommendations and implement sanitation schedules through the um, end of the TMP and so the TMP will then summarize these these steps in uh, in its document um, and uh, and prepare the city for uh, for that final step and the next step of the EA processes if uh, going through the the, um, the implementations of those of those options. Next slide. So. In uh, 2018, we had a draft uh, transportation master plan. Uh, it looked into um, the, the Wellington Street extension and alternatives to it. Uh, it looked at uh, identifying and improving access to the employment lands. It looked at uh, identifying pedestrian party streets, uh, cycling networks, uh, active transportation um, for as active transportation recommendations, and reviewing the road classifications. And this draft was presented at the Open House on October 3rd, 2018. Next slide. Uh, our the existing inf infrastructure of North Queenstown is quite um, relatively relatively well uh, laid out along uh, Division and Montreal streets, uh, and uh, and the densely packed uh, um, denser denser street map of the southern portion uh, um, shows uh, <coughs> shows a good uh, good amount of, uh, of, of of transportation options, but the northern part portion has less access, less less options, uh, with larger blocks uh, for the industrial the industrial area. Next slide. Um, and so uh, we, we some key infrastructure uh, items were then highlighted as part of the study back in 2019, and all of these will be reviewed uh, as indicated by the circles. Uh, that's the uh, John Counter, uh, the Rideau Real Railway, and uh, and uh, Montreal Street uh, intersection. Uh, some of the proposed uh, connections and uh, and what the what the KMP trail will look like. Uh, south of, uh, of that intersection in the southern where the, where the WSC used to go. And so um, the strategy was all part of, uh, was basically uh, had some neighborhood uh, cycling routes as part of the ATMP. And uh, and so the, the, the strategy was uh, provide uh, multiple options for residents to get around uh, and that we, and provide infrastructure that enables them to do that safely, to do for you that safely. Next slide. And we'll drop back to what's changed. City planning team and city communication team doing a great job. Thank you very much. Um, so uh, um, as our study went on pause in 2019, um, uh, an additional analysis was completed by the city through uh, uh, Dylan, uh, a traffic transportation consultant. Um, and you've been specifically looking into um, Reviewing the uh, the Wellington Street extension uh, in terms of um, in terms of the modelling and then breaking it up into halves, northern half and southern half. In 2019, um, the analysis showed that the northern portion um, provided benefit to the road network, uh, but the southern portion uh, did not, and uh, the, there was a, uh, enough enough road and, and uh, road connection in the southern portion that, uh, that that section of the Wellington Street extension was not deemed necessary. Um, and so um, this was put for the city council, and uh, and now that the, this revised transportation master plan will will clarify what the city's focus is in this northern section, and uh, include some conceptual cross sections and of the WSC roadway and what the uh, what the intersections will uh, will look like uh, potentially as part of this a part of the process and fits within the vision of the transportation master plan. Next slide. 
Another another change is the the Waban crossing, the uh, the third crossing that was uh, in our future future scenarios, but not in our current scenario. It's now current, and so we're we're going to include it as current. Um, it's a beautiful bridge uh, and provides great connection for the city. Opens up uh, North Kingstown's accessibility to the uh, to the to the other side of the river, the east side of the river, and uh, and so the modelling will be updated to include this as a base case, and um, and uh, and it's an active travel um, links as well. Uh, additionally, the the Montreal Street Express bus routes uh, were not um, existing; they were future, so uh, we'll bring them back to existing. And the the Household Travel Survey uh, in 2019 provided great data about the a great update to the data of uh, of the how uh, um, Kingstonians and uh, North Kingstown in particular are uh, are getting around, and uh, and uh, that data will be refreshed. It will refresh the older all the data in our uh, in our system and uh, and help in analysis. Yeah. Thanks, Michael. Um, so section four now, the, the last section of the presentation, what we're working on now. So this is where we'll provide uh, the latest updates on some of these uh, draft and some new materials. Next slide, please. So the 2019 version of this you saw earlier in the presentation. Um, this is uh, really, the updates are limited to some site specific changes where designations have, have changed uh, reflecting uh, development trends on the ground, uh, as well as some sort of common sense uh, updates as well. So you can see those in the column on the right and corresponding on the map. Um, one, one thing I'll note beyond that is the combination of the, the general industrial and the business park industrial lands of number six there. Uh, these have been lumped together, uh, simplified to, to just be called industrial, uh, recognizing the commonalities uh, across uh, the character and the uses in these areas. Next, please. So this is a, an entirely new map that uh, we've developed, the intensification areas. Um, the color coding, you can see um, what's intended uh, with the residential or mixed use sites in yellow uh, as uh, intensification sites identified, commercial sites in pink, employment sites in blue, um, as well as active street frontages, the red lines uh, primarily along uh, Montreal near the railway Rideau uh, intersection, as well as in some other um, isolated areas in the in the Northwest, for example. Um, also, you may notice the tannery site, uh, which is in the hatched pattern below Bell Park. Um, so we've just identified that as sort of a pending. We don't know what the outcome is gonna be. It's currently at the OLT, the Ontario Land Tribunal, um, that I believe is in progress. Uh, so we'll have to wait and see what happens there. Next, please. And so getting into a little more detail um, from the intensification areas um, is our building heights plan. And so just note that the, these are only the residential and mixed use sites that are identified here. So we've identified them by uh, character and what are uh, appropriate building forms uh, that are proposed. So low rise, three or four stories, mid rise, six stories and high rise up to 12 story maximum. Um, as well as parks and open space and the, the tannery site identified there as well. So really the intention here is to provide for a range of housing types and building forms. Um, the red, the darkest color uh, with the high rise noted, these are approximate tower locations only. Um, these are the locations where we think this would be, these would be most appropriate. Doesn't necessarily mean they will all be realized in a given time frame. This could be a very long-term process. Um, and those are really just the kind of flexible locations that, that we think would work for them and considering um, adjacent context and sensitive existing uses, things like that. Um, you'll see there's a real node uh, of, of density at the Railway Montreal Rideau intersection, as well as around um, John Counter Boulevard and uh, a little south of there around the uh, outer station site along Montreal Street. Um, there's a few low rise uh, potential areas in the neighborhood to the west um, in the yellow color as well. Um, some of these are, are former institutional or school sites that are, are vacant or underutilized now. However, the intention would not be for anything 
above uh, three stories in height of intensification there. Next, please. So continuing with our uh, a density study, this is a new mapping as well. And this is really a, a massing test. Um, these are conceptual. These are not meant to be building, designed buildings or architecture. It's for the purposes of, of testing the city's growth estimate, which Niall referred to earlier, and, and making sure that uh, there's capacity and that um, it can be represented in a, an appropriate form, uh, urban design best practices, uh, making sure access to the sites can be provided, uh, the mix of uses that's desired, uh, having a pedestrian scale, comfortable public realm, things like that. Um, we've tried to accommodate things like, or ensure things like a transition in height and density down to uh, existing low rise neighborhoods, as well as uh, a compatible relationship with industrial uses um, to the West, uh, as well as other lower scale uses, such as, as Bell Park to the East and smaller building contexts. Um, so this is what we're calling blocks D and E of the urban village. So this references back to the previous density plan, which uh, delineated the area by blocks. Next, please. And this is just um, a 3D aerial view. Again, these are conceptual buildings um, for testing purposes. That we refer to them as massing. Um, they have not been designed and are not, are not prescriptive uh, in terms of the way they look right now. Um, but this is useful for the existing context that these have been placed in and to just give a reference point to, to people for the area and how um, permissions for new built form might relate to what is existing. And so this is a view looking east um, from block D. Next, please. So moving on to block B, which is the second area we did this massing analysis for. Um, Block B, just south of John Counter Boulevard, is, is an area of significant density, and this is something we've heard from uh, previous consultations uh, as what might be an appropriate area for some of these taller, more dense building forms. Um, you'll note the existing nine-story slab apartment buildings uh, on the east area of this uh, location. Um, there's a lot of infill opportunities and surface parking lots and open space in this area, which is another reason um, we think it's appropriate for this type of density. Um, there's not as much uh, sensitive uses directly adjacent as well. Next, please. And here's the 3D aerial view of this area looking southeast uh, from Montreal and John Counter Boulevard. So you can see how that massing um, fits in with the existing context and some uh, of the infill potential of these sites. And these, again, would be conceptual, sort of a, a maximum building envelopes um, as kind of a starting point. Next, please. So this is intended uh, to give more of a street level impression of the three different building typologies that you would have seen uh, in those massing exercises uh, in, the, in the 3D view. So this uh, really tries to show um, things like the street wall. So the, the lower section of these buildings, the base building, which is for each of them a maximum of four stories in height. So four story street wall intends to have a comfortable scale for, for people, pedestrians, um, pleasant streetscape, uh, make sure it's not sort of uh, overwhelming in terms of the, the built form. Um, and they each of these steps back um, after the fourth story. Uh, and in the case of the, the tower, the 12 story building steps back again at the sixth story to again, ensure that uh, sense of comfort that it's not an overwhelming scale. Next, please. And here, just putting a, a realistic photo to these building typologies. So the uh, you'll see the low rise or townhouse, three or four stories, um, which may could also potentially be a low rise apartment building. Um, the six story mid rise with a step back and the tower podium, 12 story with step backs as well. Um, in, an interesting one is the adaptive reuse precedent, institutional heritage. So I mentioned earlier some of the 
uh, underutilized or vacant school sites and other in institutional or um, older buildings that uh, we think ha do carry some value and we would not want to see um, de demolished and have potential for reuse or a little bit more intensity in other uses as well, such as in this example, a uh, small housing apartment use, uh, which has been integrated with the, the heritage building at the top right there. Next, please. So here I'll just pass back to Carl Bray um, to go over some of the updated uh, draft cultural heritage content. Uh, thanks, Corey. Uh, again, I'm sorry I can't uh, see you, but uh, I will talk. Um, traditionally, uh, conservation goes under the Ontario Heritage Act, but as Corey mentioned earlier, the province has made some fairly significant changes to how effective Heritage Act tools are, mostly by restricting the amount of time required to make a designation happen. Um, so certainly they are uh, part four or individual property designations are important, but they have to be used sparingly. Um, the larger district designation under part five, it's also useful, but they, uh, again, the province has uh, made some fairly onerous requirements for the evaluation. And um, again, it's a tool to be, con to, uh, to be considered very carefully. Um, a district does, however, look at the whole, the whole uh, area. It's a holistic approach, uh, looks much more on how people experience the place on the street. Um, and it talks a lot about those sorts of things, as well as with the uh, intangible heritage that might be associated with an area. Archaeological assessments continue to be important and will continue to be required. Um, but going back to intangible, um, one of the things the secondary plan can do is recommend uh, creation of a future commemoration and interpretation plan. And that's where you could get into detailed storytelling and finding different media for telling those stories, whether they are um, uh, podcasts or walking tours or plaques uh, or combinations thereof. You can't really do that within a, a broad scale secondary plan, but you can do it in future more, more specific terms. Next, please. Um, much can be done actually under the Planning Act and, and working with the land use people. Uh, part of my job is to, is to help them integrate uh, areas of heritage character, individual heritage properties within some of the redevelopment scenarios. So uh, that's something that's important. Views can be protected under the Planning Act rather than under the Heritage Act. So that's another important thing to consider. And then last but not least, uh, the federal government does control uh, certain areas, certainly the canal, but also the designated properties. And one I know is of particular concern to most people uh, is the former train station, the outer station. That is still federally owned and it's a national historic site. So anything that happens there would be under great scrutiny from the federal government. And if uh, the property was sold, uh, there would be strong um, contingencies on that sale in terms of what type of development could happen there and how the uh, remaining heritage attributes would be conserved. Next, please. I think this gets turned over to the transportation. Oh, sorry, there's one more slide. Uh, yes. Um, the, um, there are major themes that come out of any kind of study like this, and I think it's been uh, very obvious from the conversations we've had that there are some key elements, certainly Indigenous history, but also the notion of the Swamp Ward as a coherent community, um, and some of the more recent initiatives that uh, have been recognized and are an important part of what's happening. I think there's concern that um, the places develop slowly over time. What you want to do is is enhance what's there, um, make sure development is integrated well, and that the areas that are, are stable now uh, or, or uh, have a coherent character um, are treated gently um, and the cultural heritage resources are identified and conserved and enhanced. And this whole notion of a supportive community, I think is something that's come up very strongly in the consultations. And that's something that the, to the extent to which mixed uses allow local work, affordable housing, 
and community services to thrive and be added to, uh, then that's an important part of the cultural heritage as well. Next slide, please. And then finally, uh, where some of the change is most likely to take place. Um, so there are heritage resources within areas of change uh, under urban village designations particularly. Um, uh, mostly the outer station, a few scattered former farmhouses, um, former institutional buildings, particularly the Providence Manor complex on Sydenham Street and former industrial buildings. Um, mitigation strategies, I mean, what do you do with these areas? Um, I've already mentioned the outer station. Former depot school is already in community use um, and it's more what is compatible development around it. Similarly, the waterfront, uh, make sure that the waterfront itself is conserved and enhanced. And then what kind of transition into development behind that um, enhances and, and conserves what's there. There's several former school sites and that former nursing home at uh, the Rito Crest site on uh, Montreal Street. These could be um, sites uh, for community hubs and for new housing. So again, that's something that can happen at a compatible scale. And then finally, as I mentioned previously, the use of policies and urban design guidelines within the, um, the, the planning uh, components of this study, um, that can be an important way of making sure uh, that the local character is conserved and enhanced. Thank you. Next slide, please. Pass this off to Michael from Arrow. Uh, hello again. So put, from the draft uh, transportation plan, our update analysis, that we will focus on uh, on updating uh, our transportation analysis based on all the new contexts we discussed earlier, uh, which includes the Wollongong crossing and the express bus routes amongst, and the changing travel patterns of, uh, of people of Kingston and North Kingston in particular. We'll also focus in these two areas uh, shown uh, the former function of what the northern portion of the, the Willow Street extension and uh, and also um, uh, what, what, what's the, the appropriate uh, treatment of the southern section as well so now that it's not going to be a road uh, and then the update of transportation analysis will be coupled with and assessed with uh, accessibility analysis which aims to um, focus on gaps in the walking network be addressed in the secondary plan and by Cycling company analysis, which aims to assess where cycling infrastructure will be best placed. Next slide. Uh, the accessibility analysis, uh, as shown here, um, basically sets the destinations as the commercial areas of the uh, of the of the North Queensland area. And, uh, and 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 will be used to a assess the existing. Um, uh, area and and as set up our problem opportunity statement and also then be used to test options and so if we add new links create new connections uh, how will this impact our accessibility uh, be part of the toolkit used uh, to uh, to make sure that our the aims of the vision of the transportation bus plan are met Next slide and this will also be configured to about walking as accessibility to transit. So uh, bus stops and bus routes uh, will be uh, also assessed in a similar method to try and highlight any potential issues and access to uh, to good transit, so that um, everyone has a, a, a an equitable, uh, equivalent, and powerful uh, access to uh, to to get themselves around. Next slide, uh, and then cycling comfort. So cycling comfort is. Uh, is really a large uh, factor in the uh, in, in a person's decision to cycle, and so uh, we'll uh, develop a cycling comfort analysis to qualitatively understand the likelihood of any uh, of any of cycling trips to and from certain destinations and and and, and along certain routes, and uh, and they'll be used uh, as a uh, as as a potential level of um, cycling stress to help use a metric to help give another another metric that focuses on uh, on cycling routes uh, through NKT. Additionally, Dylan will be on the team uh, and coordinating with uh, transportation uh, with uh, updating their modeling to then also have a, a, a another an extra string to the uh, to the bow of transportation analysis. Thank you.
Thanks, Michael. Uh, so that brings us to the end of the presentation and our next steps. Uh, next slide, please. So just quickly, um, immediate next steps on the project timeline. So following the open house tonight um, and leading into um, further refinement, we'll look to incorporate the feedback we received here tonight, uh, as well as on the Get Involved Kingston website. Um, so that web page will be used for additional survey questions, uh, additional comments, draft materials as they become available, um, and interviews with stakeholders, all those um, engagement pieces. And that will lead into the sixth stage here uh, up to the final report and presentation to council. So other engagement activities also including things like interviews with landowners and developers. Um, I saw there was a question about that, um, as well as reinitiating Indigenous peoples consultations. Next, please. So that brings us to the questions and comments segment. Thank you, everybody. Um, so yes, we have a few questions that have come in through the course of the presentation. Um, as you may have noticed, we've gone a little bit over. So we're going to adjust the timing for tonight's session. We're now gonna head into breakout rooms just shortly after 7.20. So we'll allow about 15 minutes for questions. Anything, and a reminder, anything we don't get to tonight, we will summarize all of the questions and they will be emailed out by the project team with answers. So everybody has access to all of the questions and all of the answers provided after the fact. Thank you again. So the first question we have that can, and I'll be going through these chronologically as they came in. Um, so the first question that we have comes from Gavin who asks, uh, will the final plan go to planning committee before it goes to council now? Yes, the, the final plan will be presented to planning committee. Uh, it's important to note that the, the process that we're going through right now is not the formal official plan amendment process under the uh, Planning Act at this point. So there will be a subsequent official plan amendment uh, complete with um, open house and statutory public meeting with the planning committee and then ultimately uh, back to council for formal consideration. Thank you. Thanks, Niall. Uh, our next question. So Jeff asks, regarding character areas, I'm curious to know how this plan will ensure high quality architectural design for new developments. The More Homes Built Faster Act has changed a lot of the planning framework since 2017, 2019. How will this plan account for the changes while protecting high quality building design? And now? Perhaps this question would be uh, best answered by uh, Carl Bray from the uh, from the project team. Thanks, Niall. Um, well, the short answer is it's very difficult to uh, to completely do so. What a secondary plan can do is, on the one hand, try to um, describe what the existing character is that people want to enhance and and model new development on, perhaps. And then secondly, there can be urban design guidelines uh, within the secondary plan um, that give staff the ability on a application by application basis to, uh, to judge the quality of the incoming design. Um, without the uh, ability to do uh, detailed commentary under site plan control, uh, it's a, more of a challenge to staff, but it's not impossible. And, and I think again, by doing some of the density exercises that uh, Corey described earlier, uh, some of you can get a pretty good sense of what would be compatible development, um, and there can be uh, precedents shown uh, to give a, um, a better flavor of what the actual designs might look like. So those are some of the tools that are possible. Um, Corey might have an additional comment on this. Yeah, I'll just say briefly, um, I think this can be addressed in more detail in uh, one of the workshop questions, which pertains to heritage in particular, but um, build form policies in, in the land use plan and the secondary plan, as well as uh, design guidelines is one thing uh, that we'd be looking at uh, to advance uh, the, this type of thing and, and quality and compatible design. 
Thank you. Um, so we have another question from Jeff who asks concerning the narrowing of site plan control. Has the city explored alternative alternative approaches to design policies, such as form based codes or community development permits? We're going to direct this question to Secreti Agarwal, Manager of Policy Planning. Um, thanks, Niall, and thanks, Jeff, for this question. Um, at this time, uh, we have not explored other alternatives um, as the changes from the province keep coming in. Um, however, um, we are looking at how zoning could help us achieve good design through um, step backs and setbacks and um, and like a tower podium type of a configuration for um, taller buildings. Thanks. Thank you, Sakriti. Um, So we've got a transportation question from Bruce who wants to know what impact the opening of the Wabin crossing has had on traffic patterns in the study area. So the Wabin crossing was included as part of the modeling update in 2019 and will be carried forward into the modeling moving uh, going forward. The modeling in 2019 showed that the opening of the Waban crossing would result in increased vehicle traffic through the study area. Staff are currently assessing traffic patterns in practice and collecting counts at intersections in the area and will integrate any additional findings into the work moving forward. Thanks, Niall. A uh, question from Lisa who asks, as a dual residential owner in the neighborhood, uh, will there be prefer will there be a preferred developer? Also, what is the anticipated blowback from the unhoused community? I'm, I'm not sure what's meant by a, a preferred developer, but the intensification areas map that uh, was presented this evening as potential intensification sites for residential commercial and uh, industrial development are owned by a wide variety of, of property owners. We haven't specifically identified those intensification areas because a certain developer owns them. They're, they're largely identified because of their, their characteristics, you know, such as large and, and vacant areas, um, lands that are located around a node, lands that are located in proximity to other developments, um, et cetera. The second part of the question, I just need to refer back the anticipated blowback from the unhoused community. Um, certainly, there's been a lot of comments within the study area about uh, unhoused um, members of the members of our community who are unhoused, and uh, NKT is seeking to create a wide variety of housing options within the study area, primarily by um, creating a significant number of opportunities for, for new units and uh, creating opportunities for units in a variety of sizes and tenures and et cetera, just a, a wide variety of residential units. Our colleagues in housing and social services uh, are actively involved with uh, services and, and programming within the community. And if there's uh, specific concerns about um, uh, development or housing and um, the unhoused community, we would ask um, those questions to be forwarded over to housing at cityofkingston.ca. Thank you, Niall. Uh, so the next question comes from Shirley, who asks, the city's official plan on Schedule 9 shows an existing heritage character area referenced in the St. Lawrence Ward. Is the thought that this area would be recognized and perhaps expanded given how many unprotected properties there are across the secondary plan area? Again, I'd like to direct this question over to Carl Bray. Uh, yes, hello. Can you hear me now? You're good, Carl. Yep. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, which area was that again? Uh, there was a computer glitch when when the question came in. That's okay. I'll repeat it. So the city's official plan on Schedule Nine shows an existing heritage character area referenced as the St. Lawrence Ward. Right. Uh, is the thought that this area would be recognized and perhaps expanded, given how many unprotected properties there are across the secondary plan area? Yes. The the character areas that are outlined in the in the uh, work that we're doing. Um, they would incorporate 
the uh, St. Lawrence Ward, uh, there'd be a slightly different boundary, but it would be the same intent that um, this is an area with a significant number of interesting properties that deserve conservation. So yes, um, that is the intent. Thank you. Um, so we have a two-part question from Gavin. Uh, Carl Bray's last slide, is it allowed to have urban design guidelines now, new provincial legislation? Um, and a follow-up, Michael Carvalho did not include the current analysis EA of the cycling pedestrian route to go over John Counter and Division. Is that not a factor for transportation in NKT? I'll answer the first part of that about the pedestrian uh, overpass. That is a separate project. Um, that project is separate from North Kingstown. It's a separate EA process that our colleagues in transportation services are undertaking at, at this point in time. There was a, a get involved uh, Kingston consultation opportunity with that relatively recently, I believe. So if you're interested in that uh, particular project, you can sign up um, and, and receive updates on that. Or alternatively, you can reach out to NKT plan and we can make that connection for you as well. The first part of that relates to, first part of the question relates to urban design guidelines. Um, and it's relating to Carl Bray's uh, slide. So I'll again ask Carl to speak to that question. Well, again, um, the intent is to uh, give as much guidance as possible to city staff on uh, uh, how to address some of these areas. But uh, one of the things the secondary plan can, can't get into a whole lot of detail. So um, I think it's fair to say that the secondary plan process or any development uh, process is going to be driven by individual applications. So it's at that stage that staff can really use some of the, uh, the broader uh, policies and guidelines from the plan to assess an individual development application. Um, so perhaps uh, I don't know whether Corey or, uh, or Niall would have a further comment on that. Well, you took the words out of my mouth, Carl, for the most part, but I, so I was just going to say, uh, yes, it is still um, a capability of, of the city to introduce um, these types of policies or design guidelines. But as Carl said, um, site-specific review by the city of an application that comes in, especially regarding a heritage resource, um, is, is ever important. And it's an, another opportunity to guide um, compatible and respectful development um, in relation to, to heritage buildings. So um, we, we can't uh, prescribe every, every detail in the secondary plan, but we can give ourselves uh, the tools and the, the, the more high level um, guidance to, to bring that about later on. Thank you, everybody. Um, so we've got a question here from Carrie who asks, are the city's properties in NKT available to see? Are they mapped? We, we can produce a map that has uh, city owned lands on it. Um, we did not have this figure within the, the presentation deck this evening, but uh, city owned lands are, are public information and, and this information can be made available to you. Um, if you want to, to reach out to NKT plan at cityofkingston.ca, uh, we can coordinate um, getting a, a, a map or a, a visual to you in, in some respect. Thank you, Niall. Uh, another question from Carrie. Will there be any green building design principles incorporated into the new plan? Corey, do you want to take this question? Sure. Um, so I would say as we uh, continue to review um, the draft materials, land use plan policies, built form guidelines, um, we this is definitely something that's on our radar. It's uh, something that is, is going to be developed a little bit later, but certainly uh, attention to best practices of, of sustainability and uh, energy efficiency, any way we can encourage uh, those types of buildings to come forward, um, we would be looking to do so. And that's just something that's really growing in, important, in importance as of late, certainly. So we can't tell people exactly what building methods and materials to use, but we can definitely uh, 
make it so that the city's review process factors those things in and as they work with with applicants on individual sites and and there will be policies speaking to these types of things yes great thanks so we've got time for a couple more questions before we move to the workshop portion um, so two related questions from Mary, who asks, in the early phase of this project, I believe that Bell Park was not included in the study area. Uh, could you explain the reasoning for now including the park in the study area? And the second question, given the extensive and important shoreline in the study area and the massive green space of Bell Park, in what ways can the planning process address the potential for development to enhance or diminish biodiversity in the city? Is it possible to attend explicitly to ecological factors as a key element of development, including mitigation of the effects of climate change? I believe that Bell Park was included within the study area um, to make to help make the pedestrian connections, the pathway connections, the connectivities, um, and it being a very important and valued component of uh, the NKT study area as identified by the community. Um, the second part of this is about the extensive shoreline, the green space, in what ways can the planning process address it? Uh, NKT identifies Bell Park as, as being part of the open space network and is not proposing any development through there. The natural heritage policies and the, the, the environmental protections within the official plan would continue to apply there. But uh, I think NKT recognizes that Bell Park has its own master plan um, being, being developed by our colleagues in, uh, in parks and would defer to the Bell Park master plan for any specific um, future improvement mechanisms, those types of things. If any of my colleagues have uh, additional materials to, uh, to add into that response, um, please re feel free to jump in. Um, I just um, I just wanted to add that um, in the early phases of the project, it was uh, Bell Island um, that was not included. So I think there maybe there was a little bit of confusion here. Thanks. Thank you, Sakriti. Uh, so we have one, we've got time for one more question, then we'll move into the workshop element. Um, as an owner of a property that has been identified as having intensi intensification potential, would I be forced to sell my property? The the short answer to this, and uh, I want to be very clear about this, is no. You would not be forced to sell your, your property whatsoever. Uh, if you've received a notice as being a, a property owner within one of the potential intensification sites uh, and you you have questions or you have concerns about that, please do reach out to, to staff and uh, we can walk you through what, what's being contemplated at, at this point in time. If you if you have really if you have strong concerns about it, uh, we would be happy to sit down with you and, and hear those concerns. But certainly the the answer is no, you would not be forced to sell your, your property full stop. Sorry, it looks like we have time just for one last one. Um, Gavin had asked, what is the justification for removing the EPA designation on the 30 meter ribbon of life and replacing this with an open space designation? That is a really good, really good question, and um, thank you for for asking that. This this mapping change as part of NKT is is actually just being done to be consistent with other recent official plan amendments um, that have already been approved uh, for the broader official plan. So we, as a as a department and as a as a community, adopted and approved a new. Um, uh, new zoning bylaw in the last year or so. And as part of that work, we undertook an official plan amendment to help implement it. Um, the, the change to the 30 meter EPA along the shorelines is referred to the, as riparian areas. And what we did was we removed those lands from the mapped EPA components and we increased the text-based policies around 
water body protections under section 3.9 of the official plan, which is the ribbon of life uh, section, and also in uh, section 6.1 being the natural heritage B features. So development is still prohibited within 30 meters as it was, but we changed from a mapped based uh, method of, it, of protecting those lands to a text based method, just so that if there were any mapping errors where features were missed, um, we would be able to pick those up through the text-based policy approach. But certainly it is not a reduction in the level of protection for those features, just a change in the methodology in which they are captured for that protection. Thank you all for those questions. So there's a couple that we weren't able to get to. As a reminder, we will summarize answers to all the questions, including the ones we weren't able to answer live. Um, and we will be sending those out to participants via the email that you registered for this event at afterwards. So you will hear back from us on that. We're now going to move to the breakout uh, workshop portion. Uh, once we move into the breakout rooms, you will be able to unmute and turn on your cameras as you want. Um, 